All right, everyone, we have reached the top of the hour. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to the last parallel session. I know that we have a little bit of competition right now with Lisa Cooley talking on the other session, but we're, I'm sure we're going to have some really great science to happen um, in this session. So our first talk of the session will be Jeffrey Simpson talking about how the Milky Way is not so special. Accretive stars also inhabit the Sprite Plateau. Um, I will give you, um, so you have 12 minutes and I will give you a warning when you have two minutes left. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, thank you. My name is Jeffrey Simpson. I am a postdoc at the University of New South Wales, which is why I'm giving you this talk from my apartment. I would like to commiserate with the organizers. I had a meeting I was organizing about three, four weeks ago when Sydney suddenly went into lockdown in the middle of the meeting. So I know the pain of turning meetings into hybrid meetings into online meetings. So this is a talk um, all about how the Milky Way is not special. And that basically the, the take home message is right there in the title that by, we've found the, the stars that were created into the Milky Way from other galaxies also show what's known as the speed plateau, the, the fact that they all have the same lithium abundance. And so this has implications for understanding what's known as the cosmological lithium problem. So um, here we go. Um, this work is all work that uses the um, Galar survey. Uh, so we've had a couple of, we've had great talks already in this conference um, using Galar work. Um, in the session, we'll have a couple more talks that have used Galar survey data. Uh, so very briefly, the Galar survey is the survey of the stars in the Milky Way. It uses the Hermes spectrograph on the Anglo Australian telescope. And we have a data release three that has about 600,000 stars and we've observed more since then, since November of last year. And you, from the spectrum, you get things like temperature and you get gravity and you get metallicity and you get this fantastic abundance set. So the big aim of Galar is to measure, or not the aim, but one of the things we do in Galar is we measure abundances for all these stars. And so we get this beautiful abundance set. So this is 27 elements here because that's a number that fits nicely onto the screen and some of the other ones are have not very many stars. But this is showing you know, the full history of the galaxy in these 27 panels. We have thin and thick disk, we have lithium, we have light elements, we have neutron capture elements, we have iron peak elements. You know, there's been a huge amount of work got that's gone into making all the, these are all plots against metallicity, I should say. And there's been a huge amount of work. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about one of them. I'm going to talk about lithium, which is the only element that matters. So the reason we're I'm going to talk about lithium and the thing I'm talking about is this issue of trying to measure the amount of lithium the universe started with, because lithium is an element that formed and was formed in the Big Bang or right, right at the start of the universe. So way, way back in the 1980s, Speed and Speed measured the amount of lithium in 10 halo dwarf stars. And what they found was this thing that's known as the Speed Plateau, which is the observation that for a large range of metallicities, so this is you know, big range of metallicities, all these stars have the same lithium abundance. And so the implication of this is you've got a bunch of stars, stars, these particular stars don't, haven't been processing the lithium in any way. So the amount of lithium they have is the amount of lithium they were born with, and it's the amount of lithium that the gas they formed from had. And if lithium is an element that formed in the Big Bang, then you could interpret this to be that the amount of lithium in the gas they formed with, because these are very old stars, is the amount of lithium that the universe formed with. And so this was kind of the interpretation they had. The problem comes when you look at this from the other direction, which is Big Bang nuclear synthesis, which is from Big Bang cosmology, can we predict the amount of lithium and hydrogen and helium that formed in the Big Bang? And so these are the latest and greatest predictions from um, data from the Planck mission. And you know, you put the uh, cosmic microwave background observations into a big pot and you stir it around with some physics and you get these predictions of the amount of uh, deuterium and helium-3 and helium-4 and lithium-7. Uh, the problem is this, that we can go and observe quasar spectra and we get a prediction of the amount of deuterium and it matches really well to the prediction. You can go and measure extragalactic H2 regions and you get a value for helium-4 that matches quite well to the prediction. But no matter how many times you look at lithium and old stars, so not just speed and speak, not those, just those 10 stars, but there's been a huge number of observations since then have looked at lithium and halo star, old stars, and you just keep getting the same value down here, and the Big Bang value is here, and this three to four times difference between these two values is known as the cosmological lithium problem. And so the thing I was interested 
in trying to see is whether the cosmological looking problem is in fact cosmological. And what I mean by this is that, as I've been saying, we've been looking, these have been, this is measurements of lithium that we're doing in dwarf stars because you need to use it in dwarf stars because once a star becomes a giant star, it will self-deplete lithium very rapidly and easily. So there's a poster by Sarah Martel where she looks at giant stars that have way too much lithium, but what we think there is happening is they're actually self-producing lithium again somehow. But every star, as it becomes a giant star, destroys its lithium. Um, so we want to observe um, dwarf stars. The problem is that dwarf stars are obviously too faint to observe in other galaxies um, that's with our current speed of telescopes. So my thought was instead of going to the stars, let's bring the stars to us. Now, this may seem like a relatively nonsense statement to make, but we know the, the paradigm of galaxy formation is hierarchical structure formation, that the Milky Way formed by the accretion, and yes, there was a Milky Way, but then there was other galaxies came into it. Uh, and so one of the major, major results that's come out of the Gaia astrometric mission is the observation that a large fraction of the local halo is clearly on orbits that are not, that the, the, the stars are on orbits that um, are unlike what you expect for a smooth halo. And so the observation is there's a large fraction of these stars in the local volume have come from a thing known as, what's been known as Gaia Sausage Enceladus. And so you can see this when you plot, um, what I'm plotting here are measurements of the orbital properties of stars out of Galar. Um, don't worry, they're just sort of angular momentum things. If you care, you'll know what they are. Um, and so on the left-hand side, we've got the reality, which is Galar, and it's all the stars in Galar. And so this, the sun sits down here somewhere. And on the right, we've got a model out of Galaxia. So this has been a model of the galaxy observed in the same way as Galar. And what you find in Galar is that there's all these stars up here that you don't get in a, in a smooth halo. And so these are these Gaia Enceladus stars. Um, so this is obviously not my discovery. This was um, work that has been, there's a nature paper all about it by Amina Halmi. There's been a huge amount of work that people have been finding these Gaia Sausage stars in lots of different ways. Um, so what I did was to select a couple of samples in Galar. So I've selected these stars that sit up here, the Gaia Sausage stars, and I selected stars that sit down here, and these are more typical canonical halo stars. And so we had a talk from Danny Horder Harrington a couple of days ago where he was talking about this um, in Apogee. Um, and so what this sort of observation you find that shows that these sausage stars do come from another galaxy is when you look at say their alpha abundance. And so what you find is that the sausage stars um, follow this track that is different to the um, other halo stars um, in magnesium, for instance. So the guy sausage stars show that go downwards versus the, sauce, the other ones go in a nice straight line. Not straight line, but across the middle of the. And so this is a, a classic signature of stars forming in a lower mass galactic system where type 1a supernova are able to reduce the amount of lithium, or the, the, there's a depletion of the amount of, not lithium, of magnesium and other alpha elements in lower mass systems that, you do, that happens in, yeah. This is the key signature that tells you these two populations have come from different galaxies, or at least have formed in different mass galaxies. And so the question now is, what do these look like in lithium? Uh, and I guess the, sort of they look the same. This is the result um, that you know, th this tells us that there is no difference in, there's no obvious difference in the lithium abundance of stars that form in different galaxies. Uh, so with the, the green dots are from the Gaia Sasha stars, the red crosses are the halo stars, they all just have the same lithium abundance. Uh, so there's a couple of interesting observations to make, take from this plot though. Um, one is obviously that we still have the cosmological lithium problem, um, which probably isn't, is not actually surprising or not really an observation per se. Um, people have made about thousands of observations of stars and keep seeing the, the, um, the cosmological lithium problem. Um, so what this says is that, and this is, so the solution to the cosmological lithium problem is not galactic evolution. Um, probably what it is, is that the stars we're observing have done something to their lithium before we observe. Uh, so there's a paper by um, Judon Gao from using Galar data in 2020, where they showed that um, if they sort of hypothesized or showed that um, if we could observe higher mass stars in the halo, they would actually be up here. So you can see the sort of blob of stars here potentially in the disk. And so you could imagine that these stars run down into this um, Big Bang value. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, but 
this or this, these are stars that if they were in the halo would sit up here on the Big Bang value. And so what you have, the, the, the solution probably this problem is that these stars have done something to their lithium in their pre-main sequence phase. And that's why they've ended up down here. And it's not a Big Bang problem. It's not, um, it's, it's not where they stars are forming. Uh, the other interesting observation is that the Gaia sausage speed plateau extends to quite a high metallicity. So you might be able to see in the background there are all the other stars in Galar that are formed in the disk and sort of central formed in the Milky Way. And you can see that they start to flare out at about F on H minus one. Um, but we don't really see that in the Gaia sausage stars. They keep extending to quite a high metallicity. Uh, and so the um, interpretation of this is probably that there hasn't there wasn't enough time in the Gaia sausage to start having something like novae going off. So novae are the thing that start to really ramp up the amount of lithium in the galaxy, and so you need to have some time frame in the galaxy before they're able to um, produce, you know, able to form novae and then have the lithium be produced in the novae to change the amount of overall lithium in the galaxy. And so the the fact we see this extend to this metallicity here says something about the um, time frame or the sort of uh, yeah this is something about the galactic chemical evolution of lithium in the guy sausage progenitor we have about a minute and a half left cool i uh, done um so, <laughs> so uh, what does this all mean so things to remember from my i guess 11 minutes because i obviously spoke a bit too quickly um you know this thing lithium is the only element that matters um, it's a really important element it's confusing it's weird uh and the, the cosmological lithium problem exists in very different kinematic populations in the halo of the Milky Way. That you can look at stars that are very eccentrical, but stars that look like the classic halo stars. Not that I showed this here, but more prograde halo orbits. All the places, all the sort of slicing and dicing you want to do, there's no obvious difference between their lithium abundances. So the cosmological lithium problem is not solved by invoking um, galactic chemical evolution. Uh, and so that basically tells us that the cosmological lithium problem is everywhere and that the Milky Way is not special. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we have, well, some comments in Slack that um, there's people are just saying it's some fighting words saying lithium is the only <laughs> element that matters. And I will take that battle offline and see what memes can be created for that. Um, but we do have a question from Luke Barnes who says, do we have any idea how far away these stars in the original galaxy formed and its mass? Um, so I think the models for Gaia Enceladus or Gaia Celestius Enceladus is sort of an LMC sized galaxy. Um, so you can definitely see if I, that, that's sort of the implication of um, this difference in the magnesium abundance is this clearly is a much lower mass galaxy than um, the Milky Way. As for, how far away it formed. I mean, it's going to be close by because it's, it impacted the Milky Way eight giga years ago, or was it eight giga years after the Milky Way formed? I can never remember. It's, it's sort of, you know, giga years ago, a collision. So it had to form relatively close to the Milky Way and the local galactic or local volume of the universe. Luke, Luke also asks, um, what's the range for the unspecialness of the Milky Way? And, um, like, is it super unspecial? Is it just like, you know, eh, about average? Mm. It's probably, I mean, it has to be average because otherwise we're it's sort of a weak anthropic principle thing. I guess I've been, um, you know, I think this is, comes from a perspective of there's been a lot of work in um, the in galactic archaeology recently with Gaia sausage and lots of people looking in lots of abundance planes to try and find differences between the Milky Way and other galaxies. Um, and this is sort of pointing out that sometimes things are the same everywhere, like their galactic chemical evolution doesn't change everything about galaxies. Lithium is an element that just is the same, at least at low metallicity everywhere. Um, clearly, there are differences in alpha elements, um, and we just have to be careful about looking for differences that may not exist. Excellent. Thank you. A couple, there's one or two other questions on Slack that you can go and answer. And let's thank Jeffrey one more time. I suppose we never thank you for, at first. <laughs> um, and now we have Luca Cortiza, who I think I've seen there at Perth Hub 2. 
who will be talking about the role of cold gas stripping on the star formation quenching of satellite galaxies. I think you might be muted. And still. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Luca Cortese. I'm staff at ICRA UWA here in Perth. And today, what I want to discuss is the role of cold scripting on the quenching of satellite galaxies. Now, I know it's Friday afternoon, and this topic is likely off from the rest of the session. So, what I'm going to do is just to give you a kind of very broad overview of a review paper that Barbara Catinella, Rory Smith, and I put together as part of the DOS review series this year for PASA. And I hope that even those who, or you who are not familiar with Galaxy Evolution will find this enjoyable. I'm more than happy to answer any specific questions during QA. Now, if you're done, let's see if this works. Okay, I just click on it. Perfect. Okay. So, those of you who have done a Galaxy course, either at undergrad or postgrad, have been taught that the Galaxy properties vary with the environment. We have the well known morphology density relation, but we also have the well known star formation rate density relation, suggesting that the environment is doing something to the properties of galaxies. And in the last few decades, thanks to our improvement of understanding of the hierarchical cluster formation, we know that satellite galaxies, which are the galaxies that have been created by bigger halo lights group and clusters, are the one where the environment is really playing a key role. And the question I'm trying to address today is how are satellites at redshift zero quenched? And so when it comes to quenching, it shouldn't come as a surprise that if we want to stop star formation, we need to do something to the gas. And in this cartoon, you see a summary of the four main ways that have been described in the literature on how we can do so. Starting from the top, we can simply think that we stop the inflow of gas into the disk. And here, the inflow of gas is indicated by the pink kind of clouds here. We stop the inflow, uh, star formation, use up the gas in the disk, and the galaxy gradually starts. However, we can be even harsher with galaxies, uh, and we can directly affect the ISM in their disk, either by stripping it by environmental effects or by ejecting it from the disk via outflows mechanism like feedback from stellar from star formation or feedback by active galactic nuclei. But there is also a fourth way. We can also try to keep the, dusk, the, the, the gas in the disk but keeping it stable against fragmentation. So the gas is there, it's doing nothing, and the galaxy is, not for, is no longer forming stars simply because the gas is not able to collapse and for giant molecular clouds. Now, it's fair to say that in the literature, you can find evidences for all these four mechanisms playing some role in the evolution of satellites. But what we'll try to convince you is that stripping is key and it's a necessary process towards the quenching of satellites. And the answer to this question already comes on slide four of this talk, because if you take your radio glasses and look at the H1 properties of galaxies, it's now evident that stripping is ubiquitous, not only in clusters, as you can see on the left, but also in the local group, in groups like M81, and even in filaments. It's fair to say that at dash zero, we have no cases of large statistical population of satellites being quenched without at least part of their H1 being stripped. So, stripping is ubiquitous, and it's an important step towards the quenching of satellites. The question is, how do I know that this leads to quenching? Well, observationally, if we start from clusters, this has been known for a few decades now, that when we look at the quenching, at the stripping, we see that the star formation starts to be quenched where the gas has been stripped, and so outside in. So quenching starts first on the other parts of the disk. In the left-hand panel here, you see just a way to quantify this. The x-axis shows you a way to define how much gas I stripped. If your galaxy is on the left, I haven't stripped any gas. If the galaxy is on the right, I've stripped a lot of gas. And the y-axis shows you different ways of characterizing the ratio of the size of the star-forming disk normalized to the size of the optical disk of galaxies. And the take-home message here is that on the left panel, the healthy uh, gas-rich galaxies, you have the star-forming disk that is much more extended than the optical disk, so I'm still growing the disk in the galaxy. 
when I go to the street family, I see that the star forming disk is shrinked and star formation is limited only in the inner parts of the galaxy where stripping has not yet been effective. And now, thanks to the advent of integral field spectroscopic survey, like the MANGA and the SAMI survey, this has been also shown in lower density environments, like uh, pairs and groups. We always find the star formation rate density profiles are always affected on the outer parts of galaxy first, even when the inner parts are not affected at all. Admittedly, if you look at these plots, the scatter is significant. And this shouldn't come as a surprise because we know that the link between H1 and star formation is quite a significant jump. We need to condense the H1 into molecules and then the molecules are doing the job and feeding star formation. Now, unfortunately there is the zoom there, but what about molecular hydrogen? That's fine, don't worry. Um, this has been a very uh, hot topic in the last 20 years because we didn't have enough data to actually quantify the effect of the environment of molecular hydrogen. In the, recent, in the interest of time, I will not go through the historical perspective and just jump on what we know now using beautiful recent pictures. Now, the point here is that thanks to the improvement of submeter telescopes, we can now see H1 stripping at place. Here you should focus your attention on the red stuff in these two beautiful images. This trace CO emission, which we use to kind of quantify the amount of H2 in a galaxy. And I hope it's uh, immediate here when we superpose the CO on the optical images that we see clear evidence of stripping of molecular hydrogen from the disk. And this is the effect of the environment on the real fuel for star formation. So the improvement of uh, observations has allowed us to detect this kind of objects on large statistical sample. Now, this image has already been shown this morning as part of the plenary session. This is just to introduce this family of jellyfish galaxies that are now starting to be found uh, with large statistics and also starting to be found in simulations. And you could ask the obvious question, right? You're telling us a story that seems to make sense, but are jellyfish a natural step in the evolution of satellites to quenching, or are, or are we just looking at beautiful weirdos? Well, this is a kind of tricky question because uh, if we think a jellyfish like the original definition where jellyfish were objects where the tail was lit up by stars. So you not only have stripping, but you also have a particular process where I have star formation in the tail. These are still very rare objects. However, now both the observation and theoretical community has, tried, has started to use this term in a kind of more general sense. And in that case, if we refer to jellyfish as any object in the tail, then it's fair to say that these are ubiquitous. Every satellite in falling in a group or in a cluster will go through some kind of jellyfish phases. And this shouldn't be a, a kind of surprise because in that case, jellyfishes are not very old. We have known about them for decades from at least when I was in primary school. As you can see in this beautiful image where you see an H alpha narrowband image with superposed radio continuum contours for a galaxy falling into an my cluster. So the picture, I hope you, you are with me, that starts to make some kind of sense, at least qualitatively. The last point I want to make is we see stripping, and stripping somehow leads to quenching, but how long does it take to do the job? How long does it take to a satellite that is falling to a group of a cluster to get quenched? And this seems a very simple answer, but uh, there has been a, a lot of debate in the literature, again, because sometimes we get lost in translation. Now, this is a cartoon shows, showing you in gray the typical star formation history of a galaxy that spends all, all its entire life on the main sequence at the relative redshift. Then we can think right and try to quench it. And this is a very simple cartoon. And you see that I start adding some important time scales used in the literature, the time when the quenching starts and the time when the galaxy crosses this phantomatic threshold between the active and the passive population that depends on our, on our selection. But so far, so good, we can quantify it very well. But then if I had a chat with my uh, simulator friends, they will tell you, well, these are not really physically meaningful. What we want to know is how long the galaxy has been a, sat a satellite, because this is much more informative. And that's fair enough. We can decide whether we start the clock when it's first in fall or when the satellite is falling into the current halo. But these add an additional level of complication, because then we need to make additional assumptions on whether the quenching starts at the time in fall or when it starts later on, and what's the shape of the quenching, 
Vega and so on and so forth. Meaning that for this only galaxy, we still, we find in the literature at least five or six different estimates of quenching time scales, some of which will be very short and some of which will be very long. And this is a, a, a lesson that I hope in particular the students will take on board. Please never ever try to use a single quenching time scale number to identify or to support or discard a quenching mechanism. So this is just to highlight the issue. What do we know actually from observation? Well, we know a lot. Where the gas is fully stripped, so where environment is able to get rid of the gas, there is no argument. Star formation is very fast. Sublation quenching is very fast local. It's almost instantaneous. Here I'm putting less than 100 million years, but it's even short. And this is kind of physics 101. Right? It's not argument there. But uh, this happens uh, very close to the pericenter passage of the orbit of a satellite into a cluster or a group. And this generally takes a lot of time since the galaxy became a satellite. I something like one, two billion years, but let's say at least one billion years. So you see already that we have instantaneous versus a few billion years. The third important point is that even in clusters, not all the gas is stripped at first pericenter, meaning that I have some gas left here, as you can see in this beautiful example. This is the most massive spiral galaxy in the center of the Virgo cluster that has just gone through its pericenter. I stripped a lot of gas, but there is still some gas left, and that gas is, can sustain star formation for at least another one or two billion years. Meaning that in this particular case, what we generally tend to call uh, both observers and theoreticians a fast quench mechanism like some pressure in this particular case can take a few billion years to quench a galaxy from the time of first in four. So again, this number quenching time scale has very little physical meaning when we just use it to try to discriminate between physical processes. So, so I'm I'm there. There. fantastic. Thank you very much. So I leave the summary slide here. I hope I just convinced you that uh, qualitatively at least uh, we are starting to get a coherent picture on how stripping affects the quenching of satellites in nearby groups and clusters. And if you want to know more, I invite you to have a, a look at this review where we intentionally try to pitch it at the level that should be uh, of interest, not only for experts in the fields, but also for students. Thank you very much, happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. That was an excellent talk. Um, we have a question in Slack from Katie Jameson who asks, how does the molecular gas mass loss in jellyfish galaxies compare to outflows in galaxies? Example, you know, in NGC 253 or zero Ooh. observations of the high Ooh, clouds that's, that's, in the Milky Way. That's a very good question. Let's see if I can go. So, the amount of mass uh, that we see in the tails, uh, it's uh, quite a lot. It's of the order of 10 to the 8 uh, solar masses of molecular hydrogen. If uh, we believe that in this kind of environments, we are able to convert CO into molecular hydrogen properly. And this is still an open question because in this particular case, the left one, uh, we have X-ray, we have H-alpha, we have molecular hydrogen. And if you do the calculation, it's amazing because 90% of the mass is in molecular hydrogen. Uh, and I still find it hard to do. But that's a, a very good question. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Adina Manuel who says, for satellite galaxies, sorry, for satellites at low stellar mass, both feedback and stripping are presumably competing quenching mechanisms. So how can we be sure that stripping due to the environment is the dominant mechanism between the two? Right, that's an excellent question. Uh, I don't think we can be sure that it's always the dominant mechanism, and I apologize if I gave that impression. I think it's clear that stripping is playing a role, and even in, in intermediate mass galaxies in clusters, we see objects like this one in this, uh, not this particular one, but think about something like this, where you have a tail of H1, but then you have a massive H alpha outflow. So it's clear that when you go into a group, the out or a cluster, the outflow can make the life of run pressure significantly easier. But uh, I would argue that we don't have evidences of the other way around, where I have an outflow and I get rid of all the gas from any falling galaxy without environmental mechanisms playing any role. 
So the two are acting together, but uh, you can have stripping without outflows, but you can't have outflow without stripping. Great, thank you. Let's go and thank Luca one more time. Thank you very much. Let's see. Once we've stopped sharing the screen. Okay, excellent. Now we have Sven Buter. who will be talking about chemical tagging and chronochemodynamics of accreted stars in Gala. All right. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. Um, well, in, this, in today's session, we, we have been traveling from Sydney to Perth. And now we're going back to Canberra and I'm speaking to you from Nunawal and Nambri country and I'm really proud to continue the tradition um, that the traditional custodians have done it, which means looking in the sky and trying to figure out what happened up there. Um, and yeah, Luke already asked a really good question, uh, well, to Jeffrey, but um, is the Milky Way special? How special is it? And we're actually still not really sure in many ways. Uh, we don't know how many mergers, for example, actually happened how quiet or how violent was the past of the Milky Way. We have a lot of clues and uh, as you see in this map here, um, Gaia has helped us to get a much, much better understanding of what actually happened in our galaxy. And I actually have to apologize for my field um, because in the past there have been so many discoveries that people either ran out of names or tried to come up with fancy new names. So you will see also in this talk that I'm going to talk a lot about something that is called the Gaia Sausage, sausage Enceladus. Um, we have other accreted structures like Sequoia or Heracles, uh, where we still try to figure out how this all fits together into a co coherent picture of how our galaxy uh, formed and evolved. And that's basically the big endeavor of galactic archaeology that I want to take you on. Now, looking at this map, what, what Gaia basically gives us is information of where stars are located and how they move. However, what we cannot get from Gaia is the chemical information. How much magnesium is in stars? How much titanium? And Gala is actually the one survey that is delivering this information for a lot of stars. 600,000 for the last data release of Gala that I've been, uh, that I've been uh, working with a lot in the past, which covers a lot of different parts. So it covers, for example, also the footprint of the K2 survey and the test survey for which we will have a lot of information in terms of astroseismology, but also, for example, planets. And you've seen previously talks, for example, from Jay Clark on that. Now, if you're interested in working with this data, and I shamelessly have to advertise it because uh, it's a great data to work with, no matter which field you come from, um, you can go to our website, uh, www.galassurvey.org, and download the data. Um, but if you just want to see what's in the data, um, I got you covered as well. So what we have done is for Gala, we have observed 600,000 stars, we have actually taken more spectra. We've taken 700,000 high resolution optical spectra. I'm showing you here in the top left, high resolution spectra um, from the Hermes spectrograph at uh, Siding Spring on Gamilaroi country. And these cover a lot of different elements. So you see a lot of absorption lines going on there. And we have observed stars that are typically locally produced, as I would say. Um, a lot of them are actually within two kiloparsec of the local um, of the solar vicinity. We know that distance is quite well. And also, if you look on the right hand side where I'm showing you the density of temperature and surface gravity, you see we have 65% main sequence turn of stars and a third of the stars that we have observed are giants. Now, from the spectra, what we can do is we can compare them to uh, synthetic spectra where we have a lot of information on the input, for example, different cocktails of uh, element abundances. And that by doing a chi-square optimization allows us to get a really good idea of which elements must be in the stars to produce the observed spectra. And on the right hand side, I'm just showing you here the distribution of all this uh, 600,000 stars in an alpha versus iron um, abundance plot. So basically zero, zero would be where the sun or stars with similar alpha and iron abundances as the sun are. And you see that a lot of stars are very close to that, but we also have a lot of other structure going on. Now, going back and focusing really on this one, we can combine our chemical information with the dynamics from Gaia, see how stars move. We can also estimate ages for these stars and combining this, we can just get a first rough idea what's in the data. That means 62% uh, of the stars are typically thin disks, so they're young and low or similar to the sun in their alpha enhancement. 27% are thick disks, so they're very old. 
um, they're typically enhanced in the alphas or not yet enhanced in the iron. We have also 2% that are metal poor, so less than one tenth of solar metallicity. But how many stars are actually accreted? Are they really important, significant? Jeffrey has already shown you this um, dynamic diagnostic tool where he's showing, or where, where I'm also showing you the angular momentum of how stars move and their radial action. So how much action is going on actually in the radial component. And you see that stars with, with one, this is normalized to the sun. So uh, one on the angular momentum are stars that basically are very on very circular orbits. And stars around zero are the ones with low angular momentum. So they move, uh, as you can see here in the top also, low angular momentum, very high eccentricities. And you can turn this around and plot the alpha versus iron abundance and color coded by the mean eccentricity. And this is where stars now pop up that have very high eccentricity, which means we can actually use this combination to identify accreted stars because they pop out locally due to their very different dynamics. So they're not moving like the disk, but they also have very different chemistry. And this is something that Pauletic Nissen and Will Schuster have found in 2010. They took stars on very high uh, or very hot dynamic orbits, and they found that, well, if you do very high resolution and high quality spectroscopy, you find stars on the low alpha sequence and on a high alpha sequence. They call them high alpha and low alpha halo. And later on, Be Vasily Belokurov and Amina Helmi looked at the dynamics of stars and found that also you can see two different substructures. And well, in this plot on the, on the left, um, they basically said that one of these substructures looks sausage-like, and that's where the name comes from. Um, now, I'm a spectroscopist, so I'm really interested in the chemistry of these stars. And Paul Das, um, uh, Keith Hawkins, Paolo Hofre have done a really interesting study because they found out that these accreted stars are really different also in their uh, alpha abundances, but also in their aluminum abundances. So we can really identify them based on these two different tools. Now, you have chemistry and dynamics. And one thing that most of you very likely know is that dynamical properties may vary a lot, especially during a merger and especially after a merger. So is it possibly better to select accreted stars chemically? And how can we actually do that? What are the telltale elements? How does this selection actually compare with the dynamical ones? So can we select stars chemically and compare them to the Gaia sausage and Saladas to figure out how significant accretion actually is? What I'm going to do is, um, for the study that I'm uh, showing you here, is I'm basically going to do the same selection as Nissen and Schuster. So I'm going to select stars on very hot orbits with low alpha. And this is something that in the left-hand side is a diagnostic tool. Again, what I'm showing you here is stars on very hot orbits are the ones that are in blue contours, very different from the local standard of rest, LSR, and the sun, which are both typically around zero, zero. So we take these hot, dynamically hot stars, and then we'd select the ones with low magnesium abundance. And then we can select these stars and compare the significance of this separation in abundance space. So we take the low alpha halo and the high alpha halo and say how different are they actually in all the different elements that we have measured in Gala. So I'm gonna show you just briefly different abundance planes and not too many, but I'm showing you here the magnesium versus sodium abundance. And in orange and red are the ones, that, the stars that we think are actually accreted because they're very different from the black contour here. Um, that is actually all of the disk stars in Galadia 3. So if we then say, uh, calculate the separation significance, we get high values of two, so it's very significant. H higher values are more significant. You can also do that for aluminum and sodium and figure out it's also very significant. You can then look at iron peak elements and figure out, well, these values are still quite high, but not all of them are very significant. And for the neutron capture elements like yttrium that I'm showing you here, these values are typically very low because as you see here, the scatter is significantly high and they're not actually very different. Now what we have is different elements and we have to find a compromise of the separation significance and how well we can actually measure these elements. So I'm showing you here the detection rate of different elements as we go towards lower and lower iron abundances, so lower and, or like more and more shallower absorption lines. And you see that for some elements like aluminum, we can actually not measure these in Galatia 3 very uh, well to low metallicities. So combining this information, we see that we have magnesium abundance, sodium and manganese abundances as really good tracers. And what I'm now doing is, and I'm not gonna tell you all the details, but you can ask me, I'm gonna apply Gaussian mixture models to these three elements to identify stars that are very different from the disk. 
And I'm showing you here the sodium iron versus magnesium manganese abundances. And the orange stars are the one that we select as chemically accreted compared to the stars that are part of the disc in this, well, you might consider this avocado-like shapes to stay with the food theme. Um, so this is our chemical selection. And I'm now interested in comparing this to our dynamical selections of accreted stars like the Gaia sausage and Celados. And for that, I'm going back into this action, radial action versus angular momentum diagram, where we have identified accreted stars because of their very, very different movement to the disc, but also the rest of the halo. And I'm interested in comparing these. And in purple, I'm going to show you soon um, the stars that actually um, agree in both of these selections. So if we look at the chemistry, um, we see that the orange stars are always on the left hand side, but the red stars, the dynamically selected stars are extending to much higher sodium values, something we will follow up. And if we go to the dynamical space in the bottom, and especially to the left hand side, I'm showing you here where the dynamics of the chemically selected stars is like, I'm, I'm hoping you can follow me here. But basically what we see Two is that, plus, thanks. We see that a lot of these orange stars are actually not within the clean dynamical box. So basically selecting accreted stars chemically will give us more than two thirds additional stars than in this uh, red clean dynamical box. And to also convince you of this quantitatively, I'm just gonna show some numbers, not too many, don't worry. Um, so we can, for example, compare the iron abundance distribution of these stars. And what you will see here is very easy, these agree very well. Then we can look at the sodium abundances and I'm going back to the plot I showed you before in this, uh, in this chemical plot. And we see again that the dynamical um, selected stars have higher sodium values than the chemically selected ones. And again, I'm showing you here um, the, the dynamic plot where we see that only 28% of the chemically selected, the orange stars are within the red box of the dynamical selection. And that is because especially a lot of the, uh, of, of the radial action of the chemically selected stars extends to much lower values. So they are on, on less radially extended orbits. Now this already brings me also to the summary. So what, do, what should you take away from this? First of all, stars are interesting. The Milky Way is really, really interesting. Um, and I believe it's very special because we have a lot of stars in it, but we haven't really, we still are struggling to understand how the Milky Way formed and evolved. And we have found a lot of evidence from accretions, for example. Now, I was interested in trying to figure out how can we select accreted stars via their chemistry. And I found the most significant chemical difference between the low alpha, so the typically accreted stars, and the high alpha halo, so very uh, disc uh, uh, stars on very um, dynamically hot orbits in different elements. So we have magnesium, silicon, sodium, aluminium, manganese, nickel, and copper, a long list of elements. But if we then take into account how well we can actually measure these elements in Galadia 3, we're basically left with magnesium, manganese, and sodium as, as our best telltale elements. And this is then what we can use to actually identify accreted stars in the chemical space. And I've combined this and com uh, compared it to the dynamical selection, finding that, for example, the dynamically selected stars have higher sodium, and if we look at the dynamical properties, we actually see that the, angular, uh, the radial action of the chemically selected stars extends much further to lower radial orbits. Um, and we only find 28% overlap in this red box. And what I'm going to do in the future is now actually, well, try to understand this overlap, try to understand the differences, because it could be either contamination, but it could also just be that we truly have these orbits um, of accreted stars um, because there has been some interaction with the disk over, over the, the past eight giga years, typically, um, after the Gaia sausage Enceladus was accreted. How much mixing was actually going on? So I really want to understand the underlying uh, structure and then add stellar ages to the pictures. And I have prepared some plots, um, but I'm going to stop here and I'm very happy to take or to answer the questions that you're actually interested in. Thank you, Sven. That was an excellent talk. Um, let's see. So we have a, so there's a couple questions on Slack and I'll just um, ask one of them from Benjamin asks, he says that, you know, with 30 abundances, that's a very high dimensional data set. And have you ever looked at um, PCA or other such techniques to help cleanly separate stars with different chemical origins? Yes. Yeah. Um, we have looked into this. Um, one of the, one of the big challenges that we're facing is we have 30 elements 
but we cannot measure all the elements in all the stars because stars are interesting, but also very, very tricky. Um, so we're basically, if we want to look at all of the 30 abundances, um, we're, yeah, we're easily going down to a very small subset. But then again, yes, um, studies of this, uh, of how much uh, information, how much uh, perpendicular information is in these stars have been done both based on observations, but also by Yan Sen Ting and other people uh, in a theoretical space. Um, and it's typically overlapping very well with uh, nuclear synthesis pathways. Um, but that's an excellent thing. And as we get more and better data, we will have to redo these exercises. But great question, yes. Thank you. Um, I'll ask the last question real quick. Um, when is DR4 coming along? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, well, so the great thing is um, we're actually still and on, uh, we're still continuing to observe. We have gotten a lot of time um, on the AAT and fingers crossed, um, we'll continue to observe for a long time. I'm actually observing tomorrow and on, on Sunday. Um, but that means also we have more data coming in and our, we're also re-observing stars. Um, so our data quality will increase and then we will have to deal with reanalyzing all of this. Um, so hopefully within the next ish year. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, let's thank Sven one more time. All right, our next talk is by Dual Mackey. You can go ahead and share your screen. He'll talk about reconstructing the formation history of Andromeda with remote globular clusters. Right, uh, can everyone hear me all right? It's all good? Um, yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you uh, for sticking around on a Friday afternoon to hear me talk about globular clusters in Andromeda. Um, I'd like to talk to you about how we're using globular clusters to trace the formation history through the stellar halo of uh, Andromeda, which is the nearest large galaxy to the Milky Way. So globular clusters are very good for this um, because they have a few useful properties. First of all, they're very bright, or well, many of them are very bright. Second, uh, they're compact. Uh, and third, many of them are very, very old. So they've been around for a very long time. They've seen all the action and they, they trace all the interesting events. All right. So why do we care about stellar halos? Well, we've just heard a very nice talk about accreted stars and stellar halos are a place where accreted stars live. Uh, it's well established um, both theoretically and um, observationally that stellar halos arise as a consequence of the accretion, uh, merger and destruction of smaller systems as they're assembled into larger systems. So here, for example, um, I have taken some very nice uh, images from this set of uh, uh, Milky Way-like galaxy models um, following uh, the formation of, of these, these systems in a full cosmological setting. So you have the full kind of merger history available for all of uh, these, um, these examples. And if you paint stars onto the dark matter halos in a sensible sort of way and then see where they end up, you get these beautiful variety of um, stellar halos surrounding these galaxies. So the reason I have these here, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to point out. First of all, uh, the morphological variety that you see here. Um, we have six rather similar galaxies, um, but with six different merger histories and you get six very different stellar halos. Um, so it's quite clear that the morphology of the stellar halo is quite closely linked to the history of accretion and merger of uh, galaxies, smaller galaxies into the larger system. And so in principle, you could work this in reverse. If you have a, a lot of information about a stellar halo, you could reverse engineer the, the accretion history um, from that information. The second thing is the vast spatial scale. So I don't know if you can see the, the axes very well, but uh, it goes to a radius of 150 kiloparsecs from the center of each galaxy. So these are really, um, stellar halos are much, much more extended than the, the central regions of galaxies where most of the light is. And that's reflected in the extreme faintness of these systems. Um, most people can't easily think in magnitudes per square arc second. Um, but so I've kind of marked on uh, the scale, the brightness in terms of the night sky glow on a, in the V-band on a dark night. Um, and you can see that uh, these things are down at a thousandth or one ten thousandth of the, the, the night sky itself. So the only way to really trace these, at least in nearby galaxies, um, is by counting stars. And so um, in the Milky Way, uh, this has been done uh, quite successfully through uh, wide field all sky surveys like SDSS. You can see this very famous image from Vasily uh, tracing um, 
uh, different structures in, in the Milky Way's halo. Um, and now we have gyro astrometry, we have things like galah and apogee where we can pull apart the Milky Way stellar halo in, in great amounts of detail. But uh, as Sven alluded to, we don't really know how normal or not normal, and I think Jeffrey said this as well, the, the Milky Way halo is. And in fact, if you look at some very simple kind of measures of ways to quantify the stellar halo, you, you know, the Milky Way turns out to be quite metal poor in its stellar halo and have a relatively low mass stellar halo compared to other similar galaxies uh, in the local universe. Um, right at the other end is M31 or Andromeda, which is the nearest system. And it has quite a very, uh, a very different uh, stellar halo to the Milky Way. It's much more metal rich, it's much more massive. And so this gives a second kind of uh, important data point and it's really worth, worth studying in detail. So that's where this survey comes in and, and many people have heard me bang on about this survey over the last 10 years or so. I'm actually not gonna talk much about this in this particular talk, but this is where a lot of the data comes from. So PANDAS um, was a, a large program on the CFHT uh, the data were taken 10 years ago. Um, there's many, many papers that you can read if you're interested. What I wanted to highlight is that the, the public, the data are now public. Um, so if you're interested in M31, you can go and download the images and or the photometric catalogs from the Canadian Astrophysics Data Centre and do whatever you want to with, with the data. Um, there's three key things that I, I want you to, to know about PANDAS. First of all, it found that M31 has a very extensive, uh, large and complex stellar halo, as I already alluded to. So here's the, the kind of famous map. It traces red giant stars in the halo of, of Andromeda, which are identified photometrically. Um, from their colors, you can guess what metallicities they have and make pretty pictures like this one. So you can see M31 has uh, lots of substructure. There's streams, over densities, there's a wide variety of metallicities that reflect the different uh, progenitors of these uh, structures. What you can't easily see in this image is if you take away all the structures, you're actually still left with a smooth underlying component as well. Um, and that's much more metal poor. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is that uh, Andromeda has a mysterious uh, rotating plane of satellites. Now I say mysterious because it's very difficult to reproduce these structures in uh, numerical models of kind of cosmological galaxy formation. So we don't really know how they form or why they form. They seem to be, you know, if you take uh, a group of dwarf galaxies and put them into this configuration, they seem to be quite unstable. They fall apart quickly, so it's odd that we see it. But if we look in this map, um, you can see all these blue points are metal poor dwarf satellites of Andromeda that are not defunct yet. They still exist. Um, and if you do a joint positional and uh, kinematic analysis, what you see is that actually about half of them form this very thin plane where uh, objects to the north or just above M31 uh, are moving typically away from us and objects to the south are moving coherently towards us. And so you get a projected angular momentum vector in this direction. So these things are, are quite mysterious and there's been a lot of work on these. We see them in other galaxies, including the Milky Way. The third thing is Andromeda has a lot of globular clusters. And so the rest of the talk will be kind of dedicated to how we're using these, these objects to trace the stellar halo, which as I mentioned, is very, very faint. You can see it on those maps quite easily, but actually getting any more information than that uh, is, is quite difficult. All right, so in pandas, uh, the, the image quality was very good and we can easily find globular clusters, mostly even by eye, okay. We found about 100 outside 25 kiloparsecs. There's already about three to 400 known in the inner parts of Andromeda. If you plot them all on the map, it has a slightly lurid uh, color scheme for which I apologize. But uh, you see that the, the clusters extend all the way to the edge of the survey area. So we see some very remote systems in Andromeda. Moreover, you can see that uh, a good number of the clusters actually seem to trace the streams and substructures. And you can show that this is actually a st statistically significant uh, association by, because we have information on the field stars and the clusters, you can count the density of field stars around each of the clusters and say, well, you know, it's unusual to have X number of them sitting on very high uh, levels of field star density compared to what you get if you just threw them down randomly. And so in principle, we can use the globular clusters to trace things like the kinematics, um, the chemistry and so on of these stellar streams. All right, so I mentioned that you can uh, count the fields, the halo stars around each of the globular clusters. What that lets you do is easily split them into subgroups. So 
On the left, I have a group that I've called substructure, which are clusters that happen to sit on a, a high local density of field halo stars. And you can see that they trace the major, many of the major streams uh, quite well. Uh, in the middle, I have, let's go to the right. On the right hand side, I have the opposite, things that don't sit on any statistically significant over density of stars. So we call these non-substructure. And they're roughly the same number as things that we can robustly identify as sitting on high local density peaks. And then in between, we have the, the things where it's not easy to distinguish. You can see a lot of them sit towards the inner parts of the system where there's a lot of substructure and it's hard to know whether a cluster just sits on top of something by random chance or whether it's actually physically associated. So I won't really talk much more about those other ones. I'd, I'd like to consider the, the clean substructure um, sample and the clean non-substructure sample. You can make some arguments if you look at the properties of these two systems, in particular how they fall off with radius, um, that they might well be associated with, uh, clearly the, the ones on the left are associated with the, the field halo substructures. But you can make an argument that the, the non-substructure clusters are actually associated with that smooth halo that I previously mentioned, um, because they actually have exactly the same power law fall off. Um, now, I mentioned clusters are bright. That means we can measure kinematics for them. Uh, we can measure radial velocities quite straightforwardly, um, which is very difficult for the field stars. Uh, these structures are extremely low surface brightness. It's actually very difficult to measure their kinematics. But we can do it for the globular clusters if you have a, a group of big telescopes that's willing to give you time. So here I've marked uh, the outer clusters that, for which we were able to obtain radial velocities. You can see that uh, something that sits on streams, for example, um, this northwest stream, it's quite a narrow thing. Um, many of the clusters clearly have similar radial velocities, whereas for a large galaxy like Andromeda, you would expect the velocity dispersion in the halo to be 100 or 150 kilometers per second. You would expect these all to be randomized. But we see groups of clusters uh, that are associated with streams close physically or projected on the sky and have correlated velocities. So we know that a lot of these clusters do actually physically trace the streams. The other thing you might notice about this map is that if you look to the left, many of the clusters are red, which means they're moving away from us. And many of the ones on the other side are blue, which means they're moving towards us. So there's some sort of rotation in the system. This has been known for a good few years now, since uh, 2013, 2014. And what we didn't have at that time- and a half left. Okay. What we didn't have at that time was this classification that I just talked about. If you redo the kinematic analysis, simply considering those two uh, physically motivated groups of clusters, one which we think traces the substructures and one which we think traces the smooth halo, they both exhibit um, strong rotation where the rotation amplitude is comparable to the velocity dispersion, but they have an orthogonal orientation. So you can see on the left hand side here, I have the clusters that are now, non-substructure, so these are smooth halo clusters, and on the right-hand side, I have the, the clusters that sit on substructures. And what you might notice, especially about the ones on the left, the smooth halo clusters, that projected angular velocity uh, vector actually matches within a very few degrees the one for the plane of satellites, which is very strange because um, what we, the way that we interpret these two groups is two major epochs of accretion or form of assembly, galaxy assembly in Andromeda's history. One quite recent, where the field stars have not had time to phase mix into a smooth halo. So that would be the substructure or um, uh, this group on the right. And uh, the group on the left um, are probably some that are accreted a very long time ago. All right. So, uh, 30 seconds, I'll mention that we have high resolution um, follow up imaging from the Hubble telescope that lets us get color magnitude diagrams for a lot of these clusters. Um, there's some systematic differences between those on streams and those off streams, um, especially concerning the horizontal branch morphologies that you see here. Um, what it shows is that those on stream have an age spread, so quite a broad range of ages, which is consistent with the fact that they might have evolved in uh, dwarf galaxies for a long period before only recently being accreted. The other thing you can see here is even by eye, line of sight distance variations, the horizontal branches are all at different levels and that actually lets us um, reproduce or measure the distances within the halo. Um, I'm working on uh, a method that, that seems to be reproducible about plus or minus 0.05 magnitudes in distance modulus and that will let us deproject the halo into three dimensions. Um, 
The last thing I'll mention is that some of these uh, HST observations are very old. They're up to 15 or 17 years old. And so in principle, if we come back um, and look at the clusters now, um, they might well have moved. So if you have a background of galaxies that don't move, 15 years ago, you observed a cluster and now you observe it again. Um, you should in principle be able to measure a proper motion. And this may let us uh, get six dimensional phase space information for many of the streams in the halo of Andromeda. And that would let us re reproduce the orbits and the history of accretion that, that produced the halo that we see today. So I'll just leave the summary up there and uh, thank you. Excellent, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, let's see, there's a couple questions on Slack and I'll just go over one of them because I think it should be a quick answer. Um, this is from Jeffrey Simpson who asks, is in the Milky Way, why don't we say this, why don't we see the same positional correlation between halo substructure and globular clusters? So I, I think the answer is that the, most of the major accretions happened a long time ago. So for example, Gaia Enceladus sausage, um, Sequoia and so on. These are very well mixed um, systems now. Uh, we've only been able to identify them through Gaia basically um, by having that six dimensional phase space. And if you look at the location of GES stars, they're all over the place. We do see it in Sagittarius. So Sagittarius is being accreted now. It's left a stream all the way around the Milky Way and it's actually got clusters, uh, you know, eight or 10 clusters that are associated clearly with that stream. So I think it's just a when it occurred type of situation. Excellent, thank you. Let's thank Duval one more time. Thank you. Stop sharing. Okay, now we have our second from last speaker, Adela Kaka. I just saw someone running in Pertub too. Oh, there we go. Excellent. Okay. Adela will be talking about the magnetic system SMS, SMSSJ 1606 1000. Almost okay. that's super important as a periodic bouncer. <laughs> Thank you. Take it away. So that works. Yep. Um, okay, so I uh, don't have the honor of having the last talk, but close to it for the session. Um, so I'll be talking about the magnetic system, SMSS. So coming from the sky map survey, 1606 minus 100 should have a four, third zero as a period bouncer. Now during this talk, I'm going to try and convince you that this is a genuine period bouncer. And I will also talk about what is an actual period bouncer. And this is work done in collaboration with Stefan Venn, Lilia Ferrari, Mike Vessel, from uh, ANU and Ernst Townsend from Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. So let's start at the beginning, um, binary star evolution. 50% of stars are found in binaries. Now that's a high fraction. So you're going to have lots of different types of binaries interactions. I'm going to be concentrating on binaries containing low mass stars. So stars that eventually become a white dwarf. Um, and what, why are binary stars important? Well, for various reasons. Well, in terms of white dwarf stars, well, they're the progenitors of type 1a supernovae, which I use as standard candles to measure cosmological distances. Um, but we still don't actually know how it's triggered and how, it's, um, how they happen. Um, one thing we have learned in recent years, okay, we said, I said 50% of stars are found in the binaries. I'm talking about main sequence stars. When you go into white dwarfs, um, binaries, they're usually about 25%. So some of these stars or main sequence have to merge on some way towards becoming a white dwarf or possibly a neutron star or other stars. Okay, you have extra binaries. So you have neutron stars, black holes in a close orbit. And and stay I mean, X-ray, X-ray binaries. Today, I'll be concentrating on cataclysmic variable stars. So these are interacting um, binaries containing a white dwarf and a low mass companion. And then, of course, you have wide binaries. What I mean by wide binaries? Well, they're moving around in common proper motion, let's say, and they're not going to interact. But they're very good in comparing ages and putting constraints on various 
properties. And what I'm showing here is just an example of sequence of what can happen in a, when you have two main sequence, what can happen. So top, you start with two main sequence, eventually the more massive star evolves, um, it forms a common envelope, so it swallows the secondary star, then the common envelope is ejected due to friction, and the two stars spiraling in, forming a closed binary. So now you have a wide warp and a low mass main sequence um, binary, and these usually can evolve into CVs, okay, cataclysmic variable stars. And then you can have all various scenarios what can happen. I'm not going to go in detail all of them, but the main thing to concentrate is that they become CVs. So CVs, this is an example. Um, what you might see after this question, this is actually a magnetic CV shown there. So you have the white wall is strongly magnetic and it's a you know, magnetic enough so you don't actually create an accretion disk, but the streaming is actually along the field lines onto the white wall. So, as I said, we're going to be dealing with CD, so it's white wall. Um, and on the right, um, we have a diagram to try and explain uh, the evolution of a CD. So I would like to say, okay, so once you have a CD that comes into contact, so you have the mass transfer. This is magnetic, non-magnetic at this stage, just, okay. Um, you're gonna lose before it even comes into, I'm sorry, it's in contact. And if it's got a period of more than three hours, you, the, you have breaking, magnetic breaking, which strings the orbit further and further. Then it reaches um, a period of about three hours where the companion star, the donor star becomes fully convective and you switch off the magnetic breaking then GR, or gravitational radiation, takes over and keeps shrinking the orbit further. And then after, so it's sort of some accretion goes into a very low state accretion rate. And once you get to about two hours, it starts accreting again. So you can see that um, you get, you're basically moving here. And at the same time, you're losing mass. So you're accreting this mass onto the white dwarf. The white dwarf actually grows a little. And then you come to this minimum. So this is the minimum of the CV period minimum. Um, when it comes to that point, the uh, thermal time scale of the donor increases so fast, much faster than the mass loss, that you actually start um, increasing the radius of the star and therefore you start increasing the period of the star. So from this point on, you start moving to longer periods again. And this part, that we call period bounces because it has bounced off the minimum period and it's now evolving further. So now I'm moving on to towards the target I'm thinking of. So we have a few period bouncer candidates. So I'm not saying last star is the only one, but it, there's a few. And in particular, two magnetic plus brown dwarf candidates. And the reason I'm saying brown dwarf is because you've lost enough mass here that actually goes into the brown dwarf mass range. So we have two of these candidates, I uh, was a third one. And the thing is, models actually predict a large number of these period bounces, but we only know of a handful of them. So where are they? And one thing I'll distinguish, we have two types of magnetic CDs. You have the polar ones um, that have white dwarf fields of more than 10 megagauss and intermediate where it's less than 10 megagauss, roughly. So, um, and before I go to our actual data, I need to talk about a little bit about magnetic fields in white dwarfs. I'm just gonna go, there's three major, now there's a parent four that came out this week, but I won't go into that one. Originally, it was assumed that magnetic fields come from fossils, um, they're fossil fields, so they come from AKBP stars, so they're sort of frozen in. And then came the merging binary scenarios. There's uh, several levels of them. Basically, you have uh, white dwarf, main sequence, it goes into another common envelope, or two main sequence, one of them creates a common envelope, dynamo is created during the common envelope and that's seeded onto the white wall. You can do this if as a disk or just the general. And also you can create magnetic fields through just two white walls merging. And then there's a theory of white wall crystallization, 
where at, at lower temperatures white wool starts crystallizing. Again, you have a sort of a dynamo and it creates a low field. But the reason I mentioned magnetic fields is because our star is actually magnetic. Okay, now I'm getting towards our star. So our star comes from the sky mapping survey. So we selected it pre-Gaia. So that's why I'm going to explain this diagram. So this is what we call a reduced prop motion diagram. Okay, um, we use the prop motion as a proxy for the distance. So here we just plot the color, and here we plot uh, the V magnitude, can be any other magnitude, plus the log of the prop motion. The idea is stars closer to us are going to have a high prop motion than stars further away from us. And you can start separating white dwarfs, sub dwarfs, and main sequence. Zooming in, this is a star mapper survey, uh, our star mapper sample, I should say. Um, so here we have the color, and again, a proxy for the distance. And what I'm plotting here is uh, we assume a mass of 1.6 average, and the various tangential velocities we're likely to have. So that would be um, 25 up to 200. And these are our spectroscopically confirmed white dwarfs. So blue is uh, helium rich white dwarfs, red is hydrogen rich white dwarfs, and it's still little triangles, they're sort of special DQ white dwarfs. But. And we've got the spectra at various telescopes um, at, in South Africa, here at the Australia Exciting Spring, and on the VLT. So this is our target, 1606 minus 100. We discovered this target when we got a spectrum at force on the ESO telescope, and that would be this. And to many people, it looks like a very messy star. But when you start thinking about it, you can sort of see Zeeman splitting. So this is at a field um, surface average field of about 50 megadows. So you start having much more complex Zeeman splitting than you would normally see, like a simple triplet. What is interesting about this star is not that it's just magnetic, but you see this emission in H, L, H beta. Um, usually to produce an emission, to see an emission line, it's usually uh, comes from a companion. Just cannot just easily create emission like that. So we obtained follow-up spectroscopy at the 3.3 meter at exciting spring using lives and found out that it's variable. Um, eventually we kind of actually fitted um, a model, to, well fitted, eyeballed a model to the um, data because it's extremely hard to model magnetic white dwarfs because there's too, way too many parameters. It's not just a magnetic field. It could be a dipole, it could be a quadrupole, it can be offset, and this has an effect on actually how the magnetic field lines are spread. So we just a minute calculate. And a half left. Okay, so that's that. Now to convince you, so these are our binary properties. Um, the idea to highlight here is these are all our measurements from wives. We also noticed a uh, variation in equivalent widths and also photometric variations. Photometric variations, we think it's due to some spot. It's not ellipsoid or anything like that, or reflection it has to be probably a spot somewhere on the white dwarf, probably due to the magnetism. Um, the mass ratio ranges widely here based on dynamics, but um, we were able to make use of guy parallax at distance. Um, SkyMapper uh, photometry, Vista photometry, and Galax photometry. Although Galax, the note is it's probably variable, so it's not that reliable, but the SkyMapper is pretty good. So we, using the parallax and the colors, we were able to constrain the temperature to almost 10,000, so 9,600, log G8.2, which corresponds to a mass of 0.72 roughly, and the distance about um, 108. Um, we could assume a progenitor if we want to look at it, but when you try to work at total age, assuming single star evolution of white dwarf, okay, I'm almost finished, um, it becomes quite low. So it's not really um, that it would, assuming this would make it a pre polar so it's very um, young age. But when we look at the diagram I showed earlier, um, 
they would put the, um, this is again the mass period relation. It puts it at the um, bouncer area, where you would expect. And when we take the temperature and period, again, same models, again, it puts it in the bouncer area. So there was evidence that it's a period bouncer, okay? But at this, also at this place, it should be about 10 giga years old, not one giga year old. So what we did, is we took kinematics, we did, did measure the kinematics. So you have the UVW, that's the um, velocities towards the galactic center and around it. And we also measured the eccentricity and the Z component of angular momentum. And both of these put this at the thick disk. And uh, Dalla work that, oh, by Sharma Dal showed that the thick disk is about nine to 10 GB years, which is much larger than a single star evolution. Therefore, we have evidence that SM1606 is a genuine bouncer. And I think this should be repeated for the other bouncers of interest since we now have Gaia and other information. And I will leave it at that. And I will also say that there's still much work to be done, like getting X-ray to calculate the accretion rate. Um, also, we think there's some cyclotron variability. So we'll get data for that. And that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Great talk. We have um, one, one quick question in the Slack channel from Thomas Thornlander that says, that mentioned that white dwarfs um, might be spotty. Is it that in itself interesting? And is it possible to dig deeper into that, into the white dwarf? Um, I missed the first part, sorry. It says you mentioned that the white dwarf might be spotty. Not really actually sure what Thomas means by this. Might be spotty. Spotty, yes. So sometimes with magnetic fields, because if you have a dipole, you have a concentration of the, the field at the poles uh, much stronger than let's on the when it's not at the poles at the equator. So you go, might have and sort of an, a spot, and if there is any accretion, you might be accreting some matter on it and might heat up and create sort of like a spot. So when you accrete along a field line, it can heat up the surface around where you have the actual poles. So that's what we think by spotting. Excellent. Let's thank Adela one more time. All right. We have our last talk of the session and last talk of the conference in this one parallel session, which is Dan Zucker. So Daniel Zucker will be talking about NIX to NIX, I'm assuming it's pronounced that way, and um, no chemical evidence of an extragalactic origin for the NIX system. Okay, first of all, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let me, oops, hold on a sec, got to do this right. Um, And now can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, hi, my name is Daniel Zucker. I'm at Macquarie University. Uh, I'm guessing I got the last talk because of my surname. So I guess they did it alphabetically maybe. Uh, in any case, um, Macquarie University is on the land of the Watamadigal clan of the Dark Nation. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking about work that I've done with uh, Jeffrey Simpson, um, who spoke earlier in the session, Sarah Martel, Grant Lewis, and the Galag collaboration. And um, as, as you've seen, a number of talks about Galag. Um, Galag uh, observations are still ongoing. I was observing for Galag last night and the night before, and I'm observing for Galag tonight. And Sven takes over from me. So we're very much still doing this. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, you've seen a bunch of this stuff in the preceding talks. Um, galaxies form hierarchically. Uh, we expect to see today a lot of structure. We see it around um, M31, as Dougal showed very nicely. Uh, we see it around the Milky Way, um, as seen with SDSS data. Um, and um, so the thing is that much of the work up to this point has been done with, well, up to the past few years, the Gaia era has been done with photometric data, at least starting with photometric data like these. Um, now, with Gaia, 
Gaia opens up kind of a new world uh, because with the parallaxes and astrometry, we can get 6D phase space information for stars in our galaxy, even, even out to kind of the nearest part of our halo. Um, and it's really revolutionized our ability to identify these stellar structures, these streams and satellites and uh, evidence of accretion events. And this tells us a lot about what's going on in the Milky Way. And, and especially with Gaia, we can do stuff that's within the Milky Way, not just these halo streams, which are relatively easy to identify because they're distinct, um, but also things that are deeply embedded in the halo, uh, deeply, sorry, deeply embedded in the Milky Way. Um, the problem is, or a problem is, when you find a stellar substructure, perhaps kinematically identified, um, or you see it spatially, um, you don't really know necessarily what it is or what it comes from. And for that, you really need abundances for the member stars, which um, again has been given, um, has been discussed in preceding talks. Um, and the abundances remain mostly constant, or a few caveats there, um, over the entire lifetime of the star. So it really tells us about the conditions in which the star is formed. For example, did the stars form in a dwarf galaxy? Um, does it tell us something about the mass of the progenitor object that is in this structure or stream? Um, and also gives us some clue as to what the latest star formation was in a star cluster or a dwarf that's been accreted, um, because you know, presumably it's not forming stars after it gets ripped apart and chewed up by the Milky Way. So how do we find the stellar evidence? And again, this is kind of recapping stuff that's been covered in some of the preceding talks. But basically the bottom line is how do you distinguish accreted stars from stars that formed in situ within the Milky Way? Um, and again, um, you can see Danny uh, Horta Darrington's talk from Wednesday or talks this session by Sven Buter and Jeffrey Simpson. But to make it just in talk, talk in very simple terms, um, stars might be clustered spatially, so you might see them as a stream on the sky, as we saw with the photometric data. Um, stars should be clustered in orbital parameters, and Sven was giving some very nice diagrams there. Um, the stellar age distribution, as I mentioned earlier, should be truncated at the time of accretion. Again, if it's a dwarf galaxy or a star cluster, you don't expect it to be making new stars once it starts getting ripped apart. Um, and also the stellar abundance pattern should tell us something about the environment in which the star is formed. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, as an example, and, and again, this is kind of covered by some of the preceding talks, uh, if you look at what the abundance characteristics are of stars that form in dwarf galaxies, generally speaking, um, they will at, be at lower alpha to Fe for a given, you know, low-ish uh, metallicity range, whereas you've got sort of up here, you've got kind of the thick disk, although there could be some created stars up there. Um, and then you've got kind of going down at this knee to the um, uh, thin disk. And you can see this, this, is, this is based on models, um, but here you see in empirical data as well, kind of thick disk, thin disk, and um, stars from dwarf galaxies. Um, so what can you do with the, these data? Well. Um, we've talked about, uh, I kind of refuse to call it the Gaia sausage and saladas because it's kind of, it's, it's making sausage salad because actually it's um, Gaia and Saladas was discovered by Helmi et al. Um, the Gaia sausage, as was so dubbed by Vasily Belokorov et al. Um, so I kind of prefer to keep the salad and the sausage separate. Um, but in any case, you've got um, this Gaia and Saladas sausage. Uh, and if you look at the abundance patterns, it's actually the alpha to Fe at a given Fe on H lies below that of the thick disk, which again suggests that it is, represents the accretion of a dwarf galaxy. Um, and here you see in the, you see similar patterns if you look at the metallicity patterns um, for the Gaia sausage from Bokoro et al. work. So that represents an accretion event. And I think most people nowadays would agree, yes, Gaia Enceladus sausage represents the accretion of, well, at least a um, dwarf galaxy onto the Milky Way. So we come to the Nix stream. So the Nix stream um, was identified as appropriate stellar stream with about 200 stars um, in the solar vicinity, so relatively nearby. Um, and it was identified by Nesib et al., uh, including in a uh, Nature Astronomy paper, by applying deep learning methods to Gaia DR2 data. Now, the kinematics of the Nix stream 
are distinct from the Milky Way stellar disk. The rotation speed lags by about 90 kilometers per second. The stars show significant radio velocity. So it looks kinematically distinct. Um, and Nessie et al. went and looked at some abundances. Now, they looked at data from the RAVE survey as re-reduced by RAVON. Um, and based on the orbits that I just mentioned, and on the magnesium to Fe, so magnesium is an alpha element, um, abundances from Ravon, they concluded that Nix was the remnant of, accreted, of an accreted dwarf galaxy. And if you look down here at a given Fe on H, it looks like the Nix stars are at a lower alpha to Fe. So that is consistent with being from a dwarf galaxy. Um, one sort of annoying detail of that though, which you know kind of occurred to us, was that the um, mean metallicity that they measured for these Nix stars was kind of high, considering that there is an empirical luminosity metallicity relation for dwarf galaxies. Um, here you see from Kirby et al, where if you go, if you look at this, this is about like minus 0.5. Um, just for reference, Gaia Enceladus sausage is around minus 1.5 Fe on H. If you look at minus 0.5, you're kind of like off the scale up here. Um, you're talking about something like the LMC. So it's a pretty major, that would have represented a pretty major accretion event, um, which, you know, and, and there's not that many stars that they identified. So it's kind of a bit odd. So we went and looked at the, uh, the Nix stars uh, using GALA data and Apogee data. And if you look, if you use the same kinematic criteria to analyze, uh, to identify uh, Nix candidates in GALA and Apogee data, uh, if you look at where they are in the magnesium to iron versus Fe on H, um, you see that in the GLAD data, the um, Nix stars all kind of come out in the thick disk as with the Apogee. And it's only in the Ravon data that they seem to come out down here. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of odd because the GLAW data and Apogee data are both based on high resolution spectroscopic data, which are supposed to be the gold, oh, I shouldn't say the gold standard. Uh, anyway, the gold standard for um, spectroscopic abundances. So, whereas the Ravon data are based on medium resolution calcium triplet spectrum. Um, we looked at some other abundances um, and comparing in GLAW data, we looked at the Guy and Celidus sausage, uh, these black dots. Um, thick disk stars, thick disk stars identified kinematically, um, and then the red dots here are the Nix stars. And if you look, the Nix stars basically look like thick disk stars in alpha Fe, magnesium Fe, nickel Fe, sodium Fe. Um, if you look at the Apogee data, where we were able to compare because Apogee probes a much larger volume, they're looking at giants. Um, we're comparing with the LMC, with the Sagittarius dwarf, with the Gaia Enceladus sausage, um, and with thick disk stars. And you see that pretty much the uh, Nix stars all come out overlapping with thick disk stars in this abundance, in these abundance plots, and not with any of the dwarf galaxies. So what we would conclude from that is that the Nix structure appears to be galactic disk kinematic structure. It appears to be essentially chemically identical with thick disk stars and not the remnant of an accreted satellite. I mean, it could be the result of an accretion event in the sense that you could have had an accretion event that disrupted the disk and that these stars were perturbed by that accretion event. Um, but it, they don't appear to be in any way chemically distinct from the thick disk of the Milky Way. Yeah, so, oh, I see you're on your conclusion now. Yeah, I'm on my conclusion, ha <laughs> ha. So just to summarize, well, it's because everybody else already did the heavy lifting here. So um, the Gaia data absolutely have revealed a huge amount of stellar substructure around and within the Milky Way. Um, but identifying what the nature of the substructure is really requires abundances for the stars. Uh, otherwise, you don't really know what you're looking at. You might identify something that's kinematically distinct, but unless you look at the abundances of the stars, you don't really know what it is or what it was. Um, or potentially even, you know, how old it was when it was created, et cetera, et cetera. So in the case of Nix, the detail of stellar abundances basically have allowed us to distinguish between what appears to be purely kinematic um, substructure in the Milky Way versus the remnants of an accreted dwarf. 
Um, and so I'm hoping that I've convinced you with this cautionary tale that spectroscopic abundances are really critical for understanding kinematically identified structures in the Milky Way, its halo, and potentially as we get to larger and larger telescopes um, other, uh, around other galaxies. And I will finish with a gratuitous cat photo. Excellent, thank you. Okay, give everyone Daniel, a Daniel round of applause. That was an excellent talk. Um, oh boy, this is a, there's a very long comment, or not really comment, question on Slack um, from Adam Stevens, who says that, I don't know if you have it up, because it Hold actually on a sec. <laughs> might Hold be on a sec. better if we read it simultaneously. All righty, let's see. But I will read it out for everyone else in case they don't have Slack open. It says, regarding the ages being truncated at the time of accretion, and I assume by accretion you mean merging, this seems like a reasonable rule of thumb. Although, if it's, gas, if it's a gas rich galaxy that merges in, the stars be deposited in the Milky Way, won't the stars deposited in the Milky Way carry gas exactly the same physical and space location? In which, in case you could have continued star formation that clustered in that phase space with the ex situ stars, and could even be could even be bursty star formation there if it collides with pre existing gas in the Milky Way. What are your thoughts? Okay. Um, well, if the current if the current satellites of the Milky Way are anything to gauge by, uh, most of the ones that are close in don't have significant amounts of gas associated with them. Um, obviously that may not have happened, that may not have been the case in the distant past. Um, yeah, I, I mean, basically, if you're adding gas from a dwarf galaxy to the Milky Way, I, I mean, the gas is going to behave differently to stars, right? I mean, because stars, in a very simplistic way, stars are kind of collisionless. So, yeah, you could have, if they did have gas and you created the gas, then you would end up forming stars in the Milky Way, but then they would be in situ stars. Presumably the gas from these galaxies would mix with the interstellar medium in the Milky Way and you'd end up with some bizarre Milky Way satellite hybrid um, stars. Um, so when I, yeah, when I say that the, the ages are, are truncated, um, I, I basically just mean that you're not going to have any stars forming in this non Milky Way like dwarf galaxy environment past the time of accretion. I, I don't know if that answered your question, but. No. Is anyone still awake? No, I am. No, I was, I was trying to see if he was trying to find a Zoom, but you know what? There is further discussion. We can always take it up on Slack. Um, with that, let's thank Daniel one more time. Give him a round of applause. Um, fantastic talks from everyone in the session today. You know, it's always difficult to stay on time, given tight schedules of only 12 minutes for talks. Um, but all, all the speakers did a very great job. Um, and thank you, everyone, especially all the attendees as well, for sticking out to the very end of the conference on the very last day for the last speakers to give them that really great support. I and mean, it's nice knowing that you were, you know, not speaking to, um, well, just me, maybe, the rest of the speakers. Um, and then I also made it so I didn't have think of a lot of questions to ask because you all did it. And because let's be honest, my brain is fried. So yes, thank you everyone for attending. I hope everyone had a great um, ASA, you know, the semi-virtual, um, online there will be a feedback form that goes out to take people's thoughts and comments about how they felt it went um so let's do that and hopefully next year it'll be more in person <laughs> but thank you everyone